Following the Japanese surrender in September 1945, the U.S. sent General Douglas MacArthur to lead a temporary occupation of Japan. Together with Emperor Hirohito, the U.S. forged a partnership with Japan that ultimately led to its tremendous success in the second half of the 20th century. In today's lecture, we will discuss how and why this was possible. First, we need to understand why the U.S. helped Japan. Following World War II, the idea of nation building becomes a new MO for helping former enemies. Never before has a country struck down an enemy then helped it lift itself back up. So what changed? First, the U.S. recognized the economic reasons Japan resorted to war. They thought that if they could find a peaceful way to solve Japan's unfavorable balance of trade, they would not need to resort to war in the future. The U.S. also recognized that the Versailles Treaty and the disarmament conference that followed may not have been fair to their former ally. However, both of these reasons would be colored by the developing Cold War. If the U.S. wanted to have Japan as an ally, then it made sense to help them rebuild. Under the Truman Doctrine, we could provide both military and monetary aid to Japan. A strong capitalist Japanese economy would be beneficial as a bulwark against communism. The U.S. could also set up military bases there. The U.S. hoped that Japan's success would be a role model to the rest of Asia. The U.S. hoped other Asian nations would follow Japan and become allies of the U.S. Part of the agreement between Japan and the U.S. was disarmament. The Japanese were forced to dismantle their military and limit themselves to a small defensive force. By law, Japan is only allowed to spend 1% of their yearly budget on this defense force. At first glance, this seems like a bad idea, very similar to what the Allies did to Germany after World War I, except it works for Japan for two reasons. One, the U.S. military protects Japan and therefore is not weakened militarily, and two, they are free to spend 99% of their yearly budget on many other things. So Japan completely reforms its economic, political, and social systems. Economically speaking, the monopolistic saibatsus are broken into smaller companies, therefore allowing for competition to flourish. Workers gain more rights, such as trade unions, and Japan's economy becomes a mixed economy through its economic planning. A mixed economy is an economy that has elements of both capitalism and socialism. The way that that worked in Japan was to have a government give private companies production quotas in exchange for tax breaks. For example, the Japanese government would give Toyota Car Company a quota of, let's say, a thousand RAV4s a day. If they met the quota, they would get their tax incentive. How does Toyota make money and get their tax break? And how does this help the Japanese economy as a whole? The four Japanese auto companies do not compete with each other over the Japanese market. They compete on the world market, and they export their cars all over the world. This offsets the cost of having to import raw materials. Thus, they are selling or exporting more than they are buying or importing and have what we call a favorable balance of trade. Next are the social reforms. Again, some of these reforms will seem odd at first glance, but ultimately will help Japan. The first is land reform. Prior to 1945, most land was owned by a small portion of the Japanese population. This limits people's abilities for social upward mobility. So a cap was set that landowners could only own up to 10 acres of land. However, the government would pay these landowners for whatever land they owned in excess of the 10 acres and sell it to other private citizens. Thus, both parties benefited and the country as a whole benefited. In terms of population control, there were massive public service campaigns encouraging two-child households. Birth control was available for free, and abortions were legal. Finally, in terms of education, Japan really soared. They spent a very large chunk of that 99% of their budget on education for all of its citizens. For much of the 20th century, Japan had the highest literacy rate in the world. Furthermore, Japan is home to over 300 universities and colleges. Politically, Japan rewrote its constitution in 1947, which limited the role of the emperor, including a public statement in which he had to renounce his claims of divinity. 
Their system is a parliamentary democracy in which a prime minister serves as the country's head of state. And there is, there is civilian control of the military. The Japanese had several advantages which helped them do well after losing World War II. They started from scratch, so the majority of its buildings and infrastructure had the latest technology, materials, systems, etc. They now highly educated and innovative Japanese people and their unique sense of reinventing themselves once again. They also have a unique way of doing business. There is much cooperation between business owners and workers, so much so that although workers have the right to strike, they rarely use it. They are treated well with decent wages and extremely good benefits. There is not an us versus them mentality between bosses and employees. Likewise, CEOs think in terms of long-term gains versus quarterly profit margins. Japan has been successful, but not without some of the same problems other countries face, like overcrowding, air pollution, crime, etc. It has recently had some backlash from those who claim they have sacrificed too many of their cultural roots to become modern, and its economy is very dependent on others due to its lack of natural resources. Still, Japan was the phoenix that literally rose from the ashes of World War II to become the third economic superpower of the world throughout the second half of the 20th century.